Did you know that nearly one in five of all adolescents ages 12 to 18 will suffer from some kind of mental illness, while less than 50% of people who suffer from common mental illnesses, like depression or anxiety, are actually being treated for their illness? In addition, by the time students are seniors, almost 70% will have tried alcohol, half will have taken an illegal drug, nearly 40% will have smoked a cigarette, and more than 20% will have used a prescription drug for a non-medical purpose. Why does this matter, and how do these relate to each other? While teens in the United States suffering from mental illness aren't getting adequate help, so many are turning to substance abuse as a form of escapism. And with the growing availability of substances, it's becoming much easier for teens to resort to substance abuse. Age is an important component in addiction because um, the brain changes a lot, and it changes a lot particularly when you are uh, growing up. According to the American Association of Family Physicians, an analysis of 2016 National Survey of Children's Health data, published online, indicated that as many as 1 in 6 children between the ages of 6 and 17 has a treatable mental health disorder, such as depression, anxiety, or ADHD. Half of these children never received treatment. So, how does that make you feel? Well, it makes me feel upset. We asked Dr. Anna Lemke, Dr. Corey Waller, and Dr. Nora Volkov what they thought about the relationship between addiction and mental illness. Based on what we know now, it's a feed forward cycle. So let me explain that for a moment. What that means is that having a mental illness or psychiatric symptoms can increase the likelihood of trying substances. This is what's commonly called the self-medication hypothesis. But then it becomes this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy because substance use means uh, school is harder, relationships fall apart, support goes away. And then those things start to build on each other. And then once people realize that they've lost a certain portion of their life, it's kind of hard not to be depressed. So coming back to the question why people take drugs, I mean, this seductive component of feeling good is something that, that actually initiates drug taking. To prove what our subjects have said, we asked a friend of ours who self-medicated why they did it. I really felt like I didn't have any control over anything in my life. And I felt that I could attain that control through the use of nicotine the way I used it. Let's review. Mental illness is a very, very prominent issue within our generation, and it isn't being properly treated. Mental illness can also drive teens to substance abuse, and with the state of our adolescent brains, SUDs, or substance use disorders, are very likely to evolve from there. So how did we get to this point? Let's first take a look at the 1950s, specifically at developments in adolescent substance abuse disorder treatment. In 1952, Riverside Hospital in New York City opened the first Center for Adolescent Addicts, which marked the birth of the juvenile-specific treatment programs. In June 1971, Nixon officially declared a war on drugs, stating that drug abuse was public enemy number one. In 1984, First Lady Nancy Reagan launched the Just Say No campaign, which was intended to highlight the dangers of drug use and discourage children from engaging in recreational drug use. Later, in 1986, Congress Congress passed the Anti-Drug Abuse Act. While these acts did help to reduce substance abuse to a degree, they also criminalized those who suffered from drug addictions and, when it came to marijuana enforcement, young people then made up the majority of arrests. One of the most prominent and familiar national efforts that has been made is the D.A.R.E. program, otherwise known as Drug Abuse Resistance Education. D.A.R.E. employed a series of lessons and discussions with students teaching them why drugs were bad and how to say no. Shortly after, in 1994, the Research Triangle Institute conducted a meta-analysis of all of the existing research on D.A.R.E. Its conclusion was withering. D.A.R.E. had little to no impact on the rates of teen drug use. Due to the legalization of medical marijuana in recent years, restrictions on the drug have loosened, allowing for greater accessibility. Do you want another commercial drug industry layered on to the drug industries that we already have? This dispensary is one of the many in Tulsa that have opened up in the past two years since medical marijuana was legalized in Oklahoma. What's special about Main Street Meds is the fact that it's 0.4 miles away from our high school. All of a sudden we're exposing a lot of teenage brains to high potency THC. Despite our arguments, many people, including some Oklahoma lawmakers, think that medical marijuana has some merit. What I've discovered is that marijuana, uh, or at least the, a particular component of it, what we call a cannabinoid, um, is the component of the plant that when in the brain, at very low levels, uh, is able to reduce this brain inflammation. However, according to Dr. Volkov, The problem is that nobody has actually done the work to demonstrate for what purposes marijuana, if anything, has a medical benefit. After weighing the options here, we found ourselves to be quite perplexed as to how we should attempt to solve this problem. Thus, we looked to the experts for advice. When we start to look at 
how we build policy around this. What we have to be able to do is build it based on what the science says. Collaborations are really important with health, with the federal government, with the streets, with the communities. We could have conversations that's not filtered or with mischaracterizations or stigma. Long story short, addiction is not a minor issue and it deserves government attention. And if you don't want to take it from us, take it from our friend Jeff Patterson, who is a sober addict. People would always tell me, grow up. Like, you're, you're, you're a man now. Like, you shouldn't act that way. You shouldn't do this. And, and the problem with growing up um, when you're an alcoholic, like a real alcoholic or a drug addict is, it's not a phase. Presidential candidates in new Congress, this issue is more relevant than ever. Drug deaths have risen on an average of 13% in 2020. If this trend continues, it'll be the sharpest increase in annual drug deaths since 2016, and teens make up a significant portion of this issue. Please consider the well-being of our American youth. We, we only have one future, and you have the power to help us.